This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is The Romance of American Communism by Vivian Gornick. Quote, Before I knew that I was Jewish or a girl, I knew that I was a member of the working class. So begins Vivian Gornick's exploration of how socialists, communists, and progressives in the 1940s and 50s created a rich, diverse world where ordinary people felt their lives connected to a larger human project. Now back in print after its initial publication in 1977, and with a new introduction by the author, The Romance of American Communism is a landmark work of new journalism, profiling American Communist Party members and fellow travelers as they joined the party, lived within its orbit, and then left in disillusionment and disappointment as Stalin's crimes became public. The Romance of American Communism by Vivian Gornick, out now from Verso Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. Before COVID-19 hit, people in the United States thought of epidemic disease as something that happened to others here and elsewhere, elsewhere, particularly in Africa. With the continent's colonial and then post-colonial political economic histories rendered invisible, Africa often appears to the global north as spectacle. A patchwork of pathologies, war, poverty, backwardness, superstition, and, of course, disease. Diseases like AIDS and Ebola. As my guest today, anthropologist Adia Benton put it, the politics of fixing Africa always requires fixing Africa in place. As a place whose current problems magically appear to pertain exclusively to Africa and to be exclusively of Africa's own making, crises appear in mystified form as the product of endogenous dysfunction rather than of the longer and wider histories in which so many powerful forces and people inside and outside of Africa are complicit. One thing I wanted to mention to clarify part of the interview, because I don't provide enough context in the interview, is when Benton and I discuss the classic work of the anthropologist E. E. Evans Pritchard on the Azandi people of North Central Africa, and what that classic work showed is that witchcraft accusations were not pre-rational or anti-rational or atavistic, but rather expressions of humans' fundamental search for causal explanations to misfortune. The reason that's relevant is that today we see people making sense of this crisis as a way to make sense of their own place in the world and to make sense of the world from the vantage point of their place within it. People look to suss out interpret explanations that posit implicit or explicit theories of how power operates in the world and that also reflect the world's power dynamics. We see this playing out right now in the conflict over who to blame for the coronavirus pandemic, with Trump and Republicans, of course, blaming China, but Joe Biden also releasing an ad that blames Trump for being too friendly with China. Others, inspired by a recently released viral online mini-documentary, blame a menacing scientific conspiracy. The fight over this causal story is a core political fight right now. We on the left have a story to advance as well, one that identifies government culpability in both China and the U.S. and elsewhere, but also the role of deforestation and industrial agriculture in facilitating the emergence of zoonotic disease, and the role of neoliberal capitalism in creating the social networks and political economic orders that facilitate diseases spread. In 2014, the largest ever Ebola outbreak emerged in West Africa, in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, 
a region that colonialism, in Marx's words, turned into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins, signaling the rosy dawn of the era of capitalist production. The region, of course, has long been pillaged, from Firestone's century-old plantation system in Liberia through recent decades' extraction of diamonds and bauxite amid long-running civil wars that took root as independence dreams cracked apart into new forms of post-colonial dependence. This is the West Africa where the 2014 Ebola outbreak emerged. West Africa long a source of extraction and profit, was suddenly reframed as primarily a threat to the global north, a disease vector. Benton writes, quote, The disruption of extraction, cultivation, and export of commodities gave rise to fears that Ebola would become a primary export to the West. The local elites were no longer comfortable in their position of managing resource extraction and allocation, of distributing aid flows to other elites, and of allowing international NGOs to conduct the parallel business of making live and letting die. In the wake of Ebola, leaders of those three countries were under pressure to prove their capacity to manage the virus and control its movements. Capitalism always minimally requires that the working class socially reproduce itself. Otherwise, there would be no working class to exploit. What the Ebola outbreak showed is that the management of the world system's bottom rungs requires a form of what Michel Foucault called biopolitics, quote, to ensure, sustain, and multiply life, to put this life in order. In this case, the emphasis was on putting West African lives in order so that those West African lives did not, before they became West African deaths, threaten those lives deemed more valuable elsewhere. Benton and I discuss how Ebola emerged within systems of power that shape fights over what disease means and how disease is responded to and how that in turn might help us make sense of what is happening right now with COVID-19. Before we get started, we depend on listener support to keep this podcast up and running. And the place that listeners go to support us is the website patreon.com slash the dig. If you, listener who is listening right now, contribute $10 or more a month, we have a left-wing book or books to send you in the mail including my own book, All American Nativism, How the Bipartisan War on Immigrants Explains Politics as We Know It. So if you are listening right now and you love the show and you like what we're doing and you turn to us for the analysis that you need and want, and you have a steady source of income during this crisis and can afford to do so, please take a quick sec and contribute what you can now at patreon.com slash the dig. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. Thank you. And here is Adia Benton, a professor of anthropology and African studies at Northwestern University. She is the author of HIV Exceptionalism, Development Through Disease in Sierra Leone, and is currently writing a book about the West African Ebola outbreak. Dia Benton, welcome to The Dig. Thank you. In 2014, the largest Ebola outbreak in history hit West Africa. To start off, explain what sort of disease Ebola is and the scope of that outbreak. Ebola looks like a lot of other diseases that are endemic to the region. So the first signs and symptoms are fever, um, lethargy, um, diarrhea, vomiting, things like that. So when the virus was first identified in the forest region of Guinea, it was easy for people to mistake that for something else. And because it hadn't been um, known in the region, it was mistaken for other things. It's only when clinicians noticed that this was not just sort of your regular run-of-the-mill malaria, your regular run-of-the-mill typhoid, that they sent samples to an international lab. I think it was a lab in France and discovered that they had, in fact, had cases of Ebola. 
So those cases were then announced to the World Health Organization, which you know, was basically put on alert. And that's true for any outbreak of Ebola because it's sort of a globally notifiable disease because it has such a high case fatality rate. It kills between 50 to 90% of the people who get it. That's since come down since we've learned much more about the virus and how to treat it, but it's still a high fatality illness. And so after some measures were put in place, and in fact, Liberia and Sierra Leone were also put on alert, There was a sense that they had identified cases, stopped its spread, and so on. Um, And so the alert seemed less urgent. And this was because the idea was in previous outbreaks, there were 20-something outbreaks before this one, starting from 1976. It doesn't spread. It doesn't reach a huge number of people. It doesn't reach the sort of critical mass that causes alarm. But what we ultimately saw that by May, June, all of the fears that erupted in in March and late March, early April in Liberia and Sierra Leone were warranted because the disease had not died out in, in this way that they expected it to. And it started to spread. And so the alarm was raised by June because it was clear that once these countries had exceeded a certain number, they would not have the hospital capacity to, to, to care for people. They wouldn't have the human resources to be able to care for people uh, in a safe and effective way or the, the kinds of supplies required to offer or deliver uh, safe care to people who were sick with Ebola. Was it the lack of, of health infrastructure that's such a, a problem in, in poor countries during normal, ordinary times that made people so vulnerable to transmission because they were caring for sick people at home, dealing with deceased people who'd passed away from Ebola at home and thus being exposed to their bodily fluids? Yeah, absolutely. Weak health infrastructure, not just to report these cases, but also to diagnose, treat, and so on. So, you know, for example, if you're in, in the city, if you're in Freetown or Conakry or Monrovia, which are the capital cities of these three countries, you may have access to a pretty good hospital because those are, you know, hospitals in the capital, private or public. But if you're in a rural area, which is where this outbreak began, you may have to travel quite a distance to get a decent quality of care. So people were falling sick at home, dying at home, so handling bodies, um, but also caring for others was the main primary route through which people experienced this. And, you know, in previous outbreaks, specifically in the Kikwit outbreak in 1994 in the Democratic Republic of Congo, that was a hospital-based outbreak. The hospital was good enough. It was a big city. It started in the hospital, poor infection control practices. And as soon as they were able to improve the protocols within the hospital, they were actually able to stop or slow down infections. Fast forward 20 years in these rural areas, you're keeping people at home until they need that sort of help. But usually by, at that time, people are so sick that going to a hospital is difficult. It's also a time when they're most infectious. And so it's it becomes an easy way to spread the disease. So you'll have caregivers becoming ill. You'll have people who help to transport the sick person to the hospital, falling ill, and so on and so forth. And that sort of helped to sustain these transmission chains. You write about how Global North governments, including the U.S., deployed soldiers to West Africa in response to Ebola. Can you talk about what that looked like, how that compared to the deployment of domestic security forces and how each was received by people on the ground? So reception to domestic military is mixed. It often relates to the longer term relationship with domestic military And that should make sense, given what we know about how militaries operate throughout the world, right? Is that there's some people who, for whom a local military presence signals significance, importance, all of these things, whereas it may be threatening to other communities, particularly communities that have experienced certain kinds of violence at the hands of those military forces. That said, the international militaries or or non-domestic ones, so the U.S. military, the British military, the French, the Chinese, and so on, were seen a bit differently because they were perceived to operate outside of local or national politics. I don't think that their arrival was necessarily seen as negative in general. 
So one of the things I observed in looking at the archives of uh, Doctors Without Borders was that many of these non-governmental organizations that are international in scope felt protected. They felt like the security situation was stabilized by the presence of these foreign militaries. Now we can do, go about the business of doing our work, even though some of those organizations have an explicitly anti-military stance. I think the interests of local elites are also served because they are sort of committed to filling in certain gaps that the government did not provide. So for example, the British military in Sierra Leone helped to set up logistics, supply chain management. They helped to set up an emergency operations center out of the Sierra Leone's armed forces headquarters. If you look at the Ghanaian response and the extent to which, say, a French military intervened, it was quite different. And I often tell uh, the people I talk to that there's no way that that isn't related to Guinea's colonial relationship with France, which was quite bitter at the end. So when the French evacuated Guinea, they, they were so upset that Guinea didn't want any of that sort of post-colonial baggage that other Francophone countries were experiencing. So they said, hi, we're leaving and we're taking all of our stuff with us. In fact, we're going to take the pipes, the kitchen sinks, and then we're going, whatever's <laughs> left, we're going to fill it up with cement and peace out. Good, good luck with your independence. And if you look at any of the sort of French military documents about their intervention, it's it's a very it's a very skeletal, very uh, I won't say limited, but 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 it's bare bones in comparison. Which isn't to say that you don't see French NGOs or, or or things like that. Those things existed, but the that military presence, that sort of muscular intervention, <laughs> is not there. The U.S. government's military, so the American military, functioned quite differently in the sense that they weren't necessarily establishing emergency systems. They were more inclined to try to build hospitals, to help build temporary infrastructure for health care delivery. This was also barracked sort of living. So American presence was very much securitized. Even care was occurring behind fences and, and behind security guards. American nationals weren't necessarily expected to mingle outside of this securitized space, or maybe were actively discouraged for their own security and safety, whatever that meant. You write that MSF, the, the famed relief organization, had the hope, quote, that it was possible to deliver military medicine without military might. That however, proved impossible, but governments had really no other institutional force at the ready that compared to military force. So is it just because the military is the only institution with the necessary resources, or is it also something about how politically and ideologically the military is seen as the solution? I definitely think it's a mixture of both. So on one side, I think it's easy to argue that the military has better resources than public health. But I also think Alex Duvall was the person who said, you know, like, the only reason we have this military as our option or as our, our good option or our best option is because we've built up those systems so much to the neglect of our very basic public health needs. When I looked at the MSF archives, one of the things that I found really striking was the extent to which people were sort of in agreement that the military was an inevitability. Like it wasn't even, it, it wasn't even like a consideration. It was an, an inevitability. Like it, they, we just happen to know that we are the best at this. That's definitely the way the British discussed this in not only the testimonies to parliament or whatever, but in the museum exhibit that they put up at the Imperial War Museum called Fighting Extremes from Ebola to ISIS. Wow. Yeah, I interviewed the curator for that. I was sort of like, you can't mean this, right? And he said, well, no, obviously, these were the parameters of the project. You know, this was part of a, like, we had a five-year funding to talk about contemporary military operations, and these two just happened to overlap. And so we decided to put this exhibit up, and they just split it in half. Like they had one color scheme for Ebola and one color scheme for ISIS. 
to make sure that you couldn't confuse them with each other, of course, right? <laughs> but then everything about the exhibit reinforce the relationship between the two things, right? It, it, it's so terrorism and Ebola basically operate or function at the same plane. And so the idea wasn't wasn't so much debated because it was it was hegemonic. It was just a common sense bedrock presumption. Yes, it, it was obvious. You know, I actually found it really interesting that he said it's obvious that they're not the same. It's obvious that we're not drawing a connection between them. And I, I kept saying, but how can you say it? They they are literally in the same exhibit. <laughs> I think to to some extent it's that right. So this military logic of uh, epidemics or war metaphors that are often uh, leveraged to mobilize populations in certain ways. So Ebola was definitely characterized as the invisible enemy. The problem lies in the fact that. Viruses live in bodies. It is not invisible, actually. It is visibilized in the human form. You know, it's visibilized in those maps that they show of of cities and states that are red and infected. And so if you find yourself declaring war on a virus in any place, you're ultimately declaring war on, on these people. And I believe that 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 idea wasn't lost on the people of West Africa. How was it that public health became securitized? This dynamic whereby the threats deemed worthy of funding a response to are portrayed as security threats, which in turn leads to a lack of anything aside from armed state agents to respond to a public health emergency, which in turn requires that the health emergency be reframed as a security threat. I think one of the things that, that we are fundamentally left with is not simply that we've bloated or, or invested in our military and our policing, but that the versions of public health in which I am trained have long had a sort of military component to them, have long had uh, policing built into them. One of the primary exports, so to speak, of the CDC, our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, is this model of what they called sort of field epidemiology. And field epidemiology is, in the States, we call it the Epidemic Intelligence Service, which came out of a, of a particular moment in the, during the Cold War, the early Cold War, when an epidemiologist who was basically helping to build the CDC out of the malaria lab that they had originally started out as said, hey, we really need to be thinking about public health threats in terms of bioterror in terms of chemical warfare. We have to have an infrastructure. We have to have a kind of human resource capacity to act as if we are detectives for, of disease, but also a, a sort of first line or frontline responder to the possibility that we might be not only attacked chemically or biologically, but that an infectious disease might pose a sort of existential threat to us. And so that's how our surveillance systems built up around public health. And so disease surveillance became one of the sort of keystones or cornerstones of public health practice in the United States. I read this this piece in uh, by an anthropologist who's a physician, uh, I think it was it in Guatemala, maybe. He interviewed a bunch of people who went through this training program and they called it a maquiladora, basically a factory. It's a factory. They're sort of churning out these people who can do field epidemiology in these countries so that they can say that they've built the capacity of local actors to do this epidemic intelligence work. So there's that. But then there's this sort of other driving force within public health, which is that it's about the management of population. And it's often about the optimization of a population's health within a particular boundary. So that's a state boundary um, national boundaries, and so on. And so to some extent, that's how it also reproduces the logics of sovereignty and security. And you write that another side of this is that even in normal times when there's not a disease outbreak that's being responded to, that ordinary humanitarian missions are already deeply securitized with aid workers living in compounds and riding around in SUVs. So how do these two things intersect this militarized logic of outbreak response that we saw with the Ebola outbreak 
and the sort of everyday securitization of managing global South immiseration. Right. So that's, I mean, that's the other thing is that the layers become almost indistinguishable from each other. So whenever I lived in West Africa as an NGO person, I absolutely lived in a house that had security guards, that had a vehicle, that had gates, you know, had a fence with barbed wire. I was expected to travel in certain circles of people and have my movements tracked. And this was in peacetime. So I would say one of the things that I think is very central to this spatial arrangement is that it presumes that by definition, the outside space is insecure, but also that the people who are inside the fence require a special protection. Which conveys a, a not so hard to figure out implicit value judgment about which lives are worth what. Exactly. And I, th- I think there is a, a way that this kind of barracks living becomes a part of the, the social fabric. It mirrors or, or, or mimics what Fanon and other critics of colonialism have talked about, the sort of police soldier management of the boundaries between the rich and the poor, or between the European quarter and the, and the Kasbah or whatever. So, for example, when I lived in Lagos, I lived on a USAID compound for part of my stay. And, you know, when I tell a Lagosian, oh, I live in Ikoyi or and the office was in Victoria Island, they understand that as, well, that's where the rich and elites, Nigerian elites live now. But it's also the place where the European elite would have lived. In Freetown, that was Hill Station, which is actually the name of every place that the Brits retreated to to get away from the hot climate. And, and you know, so it sort of elevated these elevated stations, Hill Station. It was old British colonial space, and you can see it in the architecture as well. Like the, uh, some of those houses are built on stilts so that they're even further elevated and away from, say, the malarial air and the mosquitoes. And so all of those, that same kind of landscape of colonialism is both related to public health regimes, but also to the separation between colonial elites and everyone else. And I I say that that's sort of like the defensive landscape of aid. The irony, it seems, is that this defensive landscape of aid that, that you're talking about is embedded in precisely this larger political, economic, and geopolitical landscape that is rendering this aid necessary in the first place. That is absolutely true. We are we are fulfilling our own logic. It is it is the most bizarre thing. And I think about it a lot, you know, like yes, we basically continue to 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 reproduce the thing that we're trying that we think we're we're or we claim to be trying to address. And so uh, yeah, I always say fixing Africa requires fixing Africa, fixing it in place as an object of analysis, as an object of intervention, to be able to do the intervention. And so often what it does is it, it, it leads to or reproduces this logic that, that makes the intervention necessary and possible. I like that a lot, that fixing Africa requires fixing it in place. It all also requires fixing it outside of space and time as though Africa's problems pertain to, to Africa rather than the world that, that Africa is within. You write about how this that sort of segregated barracks living dynamic got incredibly ugly, much uglier when the acute crisis of Ebola hit in West Point, a neighborhood in, in Monrovia, Liberia. The entire neighborhood was was locked up behind a massive cordon sanitaire, which sparked these huge protests and a brutal police response. They opened fire killing a teenager. And you write that the response to Ebola was read through the neighborhood's pre-existing reputation for poverty and criminality. And the lockdown, one resident that that you cite, says that it functioned to, to further pathologize the West Point neighborhood as diseased, which reminds me a lot about what happened in New Orleans after Katrina, where black victims were framed as dangerous threats, in part, I think, to legitimate in real time the the mistreatment that they were subjected to. You write, quote, a heightened awareness of insecurity among aid workers may compel them 
to interpret overt challenges to their authority as a threat to their security, it may inspire further acts of defensiveness. Is it almost inevitable that people who are victimized by capital in the state during ordinary times will not be treated as true victims by those very same powers who are managing these acute crises? I'm not sure it's inevitable, but I think it you have to acknowledge the extent to which conditions uh, under emergency or not are shaping their experiences of you as as an intervener. And I'm not sure if that's if that is um, somehow diminished if the person who is intervening is from the community, whatever that might look like or what that means. I was thinking about a friend who actually, basically during the Ebola outbreak, she was she came back to Sierra Leone after I think being away for a few years to just volunteer. And she had been working for the UN all over the world. And she she said, I really want to help my people. So she somehow got a gig with uh, the World Health Organization back in the place where she grew up, where she knew the language and she knew people. And there was a moment where she said, you know, she said she went in with another, I think another West African uh, anthropologist who spoke French. And she said, there was a moment where she started to realize that everyone was going to turn on them. And it might have gotten violent, despite the fact that they were coming with resources and, and good intentions and all of these things. And she had to mutter to the guy in French, we got to get out of here. It is dangerous. <laughs> People are not ready for us. And so, you know, I guess what I'm saying is, is not only is there this um, this side of, of sort of government or state response that may look that may come across as and may actually be violent, uh, may be dehumanizing and all of these things. There's also a kind of historically embedded, historically produced wariness that shapes how people respond to people who come in and say, we want to help. Because help is usually ephemeral. Help is usually, you know, it, 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 isn't, it isn't producing long-lasting change. It isn't producing benefits it, or resulting in something that is beneficial and that ultimately changes the nature of, you know, sort of the day-to-day -day or of, of even the sort of effects of an acute crisis. So I'm not sure it's inevitable, but I, I do think that one of the things that we are seeing even in our current sort of situation is that you have to kind of meet people where they are and understand how their challenges are maybe even rooted in distrust of the, the kinds of interventions that you claim to be, that you want to bring in or, the, or that you claim to be introducing and that you claim are going to help. You cite a, some powerful examples from, from Guinea where in, in the, the forest region, a rural area of the country where that the Ebola outbreak first emerged, locals murdered eight Ghanaian journalists and health workers. And you cite anthropologist Julian Anoko, who wrote, quote, the outbreak has become, for these rebellious communities, an arena in which to be heard and to hope to obtain solutions for unemployment and poverty, access to education and health, new schools, bridges and roads, among other things. But you write that communities like this were instead portrayed as backwards and irrationally recalcitrant to being helped, which which in turn, you write, fed into more repression because, quote, the viral spread of security measures themselves also builds barriers that foster community resentment of those providing health care. They shape the subjectivities of aid and health workers. By February 2015, you write, the Ghanaian Red Cross had reported that their mobile teams were being targeted in at least 10 attacks each month. Today, we're reading about attacks against nurses in Mexico and the Philippines, and healthcare workers were assaulted recently in India. How is it that people can come to see medical workers as a threat? For me, when I see this, these kinds of attacks, I usually ask, what had the previous relationship been like? So have they only come in times of crisis, and particularly crisis that are presumed to spill over? into, into um, the spaces of elites? Is it that the quality of the interventions have often, or the character of the interventions have been um, ones aligned with 
elite interests or state interests or something else? Is it that that those relationships have been perceived as malignant or malevolent? So there had been similar kinds of attacks during the Ebola crisis in the Democratic Republic of Congo, also in Sierra Leone, because those places were seen as hotbeds of disease and they were seen as places that had not been providing care. They were not seen as caring institutions and the people who worked at, functioned as their agents of those institutions were not perceived to be caring agents. And in fact, they might have been seen as actively producing or spreading or whatever, transmitting the disease. And so what ultimately happens is this kind of defensiveness built into health education and aid. And so any any sort of overt questioning of their authority, overt questioning of what they're trying to do, gets read as an act of reticence or resistance. And then it kind of creates all of these sort of uh, more problems. Every act of, of questioning is a violent act that, that sort of requires aid workers to recede or aid workers to retreat or aid workers to even mobilize state violence in ways if they have access to that. And one of the things that I, along with some other colleagues, have argued is that the clinic is, ne is never a neutral space, even though that's sort of like the war rules, you know, that clinics are somehow neutral places. But my, uh, me and my colleagues have argued that that's pre precisely why they're great places to attack. So if you have a political beef and you want to neutralize the neutral <laughs> or acknowledge the political nature of the clinic, you actually absolutely have to attack it. It, it's the perfect target, in other words, in some ways. And you see that, you saw that in Turkey during the um, during Gezi pro, uh, protests, uh, where medics were actually attacked by the state because they were providing care to protesters. You'll see that uh, in Syria. And I would not put it past the U.S. government to absolutely target clinics. Or to use the ostensibly apolitical or politically neutral sphere of, of medical aid as a cover for military operations, as happened in Pakistan when the U.S. used a vaccination program as a cover to identify the location of Osama bin Laden, which has had major public health ramifications. You, you write about how this played out in, in West Africa, and you write, quote, many ideas about Ebola spread in Sierra Leone and among its diaspora that the Ebola crisis was fabricated by the government to garner funding from rich states in Europe and North America, that the crisis was initially overstated to give the government free range to limit growing challenges to its authority, that the disease had entered the community through a viral hemorrhagic fever lab sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense and Tulane University, that clinicians and researchers in hospitals were stealing blood and organs from people who entered with mysterious symptoms, that mining, agriculture, and biofuels interests were using the disease to secure more land for extractive industries, that pharmaceutical companies were infecting people to test their vaccines and medicines, that international humanitarian organizations had brought the disease with them to Ebola endemic areas, and finally, that Ebola was an enemy of the people, a virus possibly released to decimate the population. What can we learn from conspiracy theories when we try to understand them, as you write as, quote, a crisis in meaning, rather than, than simply dismiss them? If we're going to take conspiracy theory seriously, we have to take this the theory part, right? And I would say conspiracy theories are often theories of power. So if a, if a conspiracy theory... Um, suggests that Tulane University and the Department of Defense are actively conspiring to release virus into the community so that they can test vaccines or treatments. It raises questions about how people come to understand their relationship to, a, say, a, a U.S. university, its relationships to its funders, Department of Defense, and how long these communities have experienced their relationships to these kinds of institutions in, in ways that, that look like extraction, that look like exploitation. It, it seems significant that people in Guinea would be predisposed to, to readily presume that 
global north powers that be were conspiring to mass murder them. Oh, absolutely. And and I would say in addition to the global north, the Ghanaian government. So there had been these re-education centers, basically torture sites run by the government, uh, by the Ghanaian government in the sort of African socialist period. So it's hard to not see, especially linked to a deadly disease like Ebola, the extent to which this might reflect some powerful entity's desire to exterminate a particular group of people. I was thinking about uh, E.E. Evans Pritchard and his classic article, Witchcraft Oracles and Magic Among the Azandi. And uh, I was thinking about how the Komarovs, how they found this kind of same thing to be very much alive within contemporary neoliberal Africa as this thoroughly, pervasively modern, contemporary, of-the-moment response to the world, the messy world as it is. So one of the things that Evans Pritchard is really quite interested in is the sort of broad racial claim that these people, and in his case, these people living in South Sudan, have no system of rationality, no like science, no no way of making sense of the world that looks rational to the West. But he's saying, okay, not only are these people sophisticated in terms of their political organization and how they manage conflict and so on and so forth, he did open up a really interesting way of thinking about why bad things happen to good people at the time that they happen to them, right? The granary falls and hit, falls on this man's head as he's passing by or it, it collapses on, on top of him. And, and people are like, you know, why did this happen? Why did this happen now? And someone might say, well, this was this person experienced this misfortune at this particular time because of some witchcraft that somebody did. But they also know that termites ate the legs and that's why the granary collapsed. But the question isn't why it collapsed scientifically. It's why did that person, why at that time? So what it's actually doing is sort of saying, there are sort of structural explanations or, or even mystical explanations or whatever, but there are people, always people involved. There's always an agent. Nothing is just happening by chance. There are a bunch of different questions um, that might be opened up by not only taking seriously the connections people are making, but the ones that they are either afraid to make or I guess are never challenged to make. And not only that, but when we're trying to kind of understand or, or, or tease out the causal mechanisms and we seek the assistance of an expert who, who can do that for us, they are often at a loss when they have to craft their accusation, right? They can't accuse the village head. They can't accuse his wife unless, you know, she's a powerless person. So the idea is that who cannot be named who cannot be accused? That's diagnostic of power. And you see this in the sort of West African anthropological literature as well, which is that the mask conceals something, but that's not to say that what you're seeing is what is there. <laughs> There's a, a, a lot going on in the silences, in the interstices, and that's where you do your analysis. You know, I spend a lot of my time saying, they told us this, but why haven't they explicitly addressed that? And that's essentially what, you know, a lot of, of my concerns are when I'm talk when I'm thinking about these conspiracy theories. In terms of what happened with, with Ebola, with the 2014 outbreak and what's happening now with, with COVID, is there something in particular about the way that scientific authority legitimates itself that feeds into this conspiracist thinking around both disease and treatment of disease and response? public health response to disease. But I think to some extent, our, our ability to question things um, and to question and to unpack can also be a challenge to the science. Our sort of insistence that there is such a thing as a science for the people, <laughs> that if one has a certain level of education and knowledge about something, they should be able to read, digest, process, and make decisions on the basis of that science. And that any t any new scientific knowledge, you know, a person can sort of unpack it and, and 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 form opinions, right? If they've been given the right tools, and to some extent, the sort of destabilization of expertise, while 
good and and was effective for like say improving access for AIDS activists to to get better faster experimental therapies for AIDS also helps to challenge the authority of scientific experts who are actually trying to help craft public health interventions to to protect people and to save lives you know scientific skepticism built into science itself also helps therefore helps to undo some of the the sort of legitimacy and authority that scientific expertise has right so it's sort of a, a part of the baked in quality is like you want you want to produce scientific skeptics or ske- people who can read the science critically but what you also get are people who ultimately undermine and challenge the authority of science one one big part of these these narratives is people trying to determine where COVID comes from. And and you write about this in terms of Obama announcing the deployment of 3,000 U.S. troops to Liberia. And he said, quote, we know that the best way to protect Americans ultimately is going to stop this outbreak at the source. Why did the rationale for the mission require establishing the importance of the African there vis-a-vis here? So basically because of Trump, I actually went back to review all of these Obama speeches during the Ebola crisis. And as you listen to all of those speeches and read them, what you notice is that he's trying to make a couple of different cases. The first is that we are currently not experiencing this threat on U.S. soil, but we could and the way that we could is because is by these sort of you know the co- sort of the cosmopolitan movements of of our people and of certain Africans to to the United States, which is essentially how we did get it in the United States. And so one of the things that he's doing he he's already sort of made it clear that there's going to be an intervention by the U.S. government. In fact, the CDC had already been. Bringing, sending lots of people over by that, the point, the time at which he made that speech. So what he's trying to do first and foremost is to tell the American people, we're intervening over there. And it's a humanitarian mission. Like we are, we want these people not to die. We are good people, right? And we're helpful and we love these, you know, poor people. But I just want you to know, this isn't just a humanitarian mission. It is also us protecting ourselves. Because if we stop it over there, then we don't have to deal with it over here. If we send our people over, and he says it so many times that I kind of, I took his word for it. Um, He's sort of anticipating a critique, which is why are we spending all of our money and our time on those people over there? Let them handle their own problems. So first is to establish the humanitarian need, but to recognize that that there's no sort of disinterested perspective here. This is not a charitable endeavor that only benefits these Africans. It benefits us because as long as we keep it over there, we're fine. And so it's stopping it at its source, but also stopping it at its source. And and you write, quote, Obama's emphasis on the source reveals a preoccupation with searching for the origin of the outbreak. Anthropologists have written extensively about how people explain misfortune by seeking its source. They go to great lengths to discover the answers to these questions. Who is responsible? Why us? Why now? And that that's certainly been the case today with COVID as the Trump administration pushes intelligence agencies to find proof that coronavirus emerged from a Chinese laboratory. What have anthropologists discovered about, about how and why people go about searching for embodied human authors of their misfortune. And why does that tendency so often seem so congenial to right-wing interpretive frames? Everyone is actually uh, sort of seduced by the search for the origin. I think that the way the right-wing tends to frame that origin story, it's one that's, you know, malicious, malevolent, and certainly racialized. The origin stories I often think about are what are the social mechanisms by which these disease outbreaks arise? What are the political and economic ones 
right? So there's going to be a huge group of leftists, especially leftist virologists and and phylogeneticists and all of that, who are going to say, well, let's talk about agriculture and factory farms. Let's talk about climate change. Let's talk about um, palm plantations. Let's think beyond the, the possible laboratories, Phil, or let's think beyond Wuhan, right? Let's think about what kinds of sort of large scale practices shape the potential for these events to cause catastrophic harm. I'm Aziz Rana, and you're listening to The Dig, a great place for analysis about where we are, how we got here, and what can be done. It's my favorite podcast, and you can support it at patreon.com. This episode of The Dig, like every episode of The Dig, is produced in partnership with Jacobin Magazine. Jacobin is an incredible publication, and you've probably seen a lot of what they've published online. But they also have a really beautiful print magazine. It comes out quarterly and has well over 100 pages packed with illustrations, infographics, and some of the best graphic design in the country. Dig listeners can join 50,000 Jacobin subscribers developing socialist political thought and debate for just $15 a year. $15 gets you an entire year of Jacobin in print and access to the magazine's entire back catalog. If you've never subscribed to Jacobin before, you can access this deal by going to bit.ly slash dig jacobin all lowercase that's bit.ly slash dig jacobin b-i-t dot l-y dig jacobin all lowercase you mentioned the ebola as an invisible enemy and of course that same sort of language of war against an invisible enemy is is happening now with covid trump uses that that phrase all the time, but also Biden has embraced the war framework. And this is all particularly ironic given that it's precisely our myopic focus on threats as being exclusively coming from either terrorism or crime that has led us to be so ill-prepared for COVID in the first place and which is leading us to be extremely unprepared for, for climate change as well. How does this war talk make make invisible disease visible in a in a in a particular way i think one of the the challenges is i think the war metaphor or war thinking treats certain people as offenders right so i spend too much time on twitter but one of the things i I've, I've noticed is the number of people who are willing to like take pictures of people violating the rules and reporting on them you know, not necessarily like reporting them to the police, but really sort of taking time out of their whatever it is that they're doing to note people's violations of orders. Like my dad was apparently going to the grocery store every three days. My 70 blank year old dad was going to the grocery store every three days wearing his mask and really pissed off when he saw people not wearing their masks. He no, he didn't even think about the fact that he was at the, going to the grocery store two to, every two to three days has a, has a heart condition instead of every two weeks. Right, like Dad, you can die. <laughs> you, of all people, you should be at home. See, listen to me though. So I just justified it with care. Oh, I care about my dad. I mean, I do care about my dad, but. <laughs> That's also a part of this disciplinary regime, right? Couching this form of discipline, or self-discipline and kind of localized or privatized discipline, tr- turning that into a, 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 an idiom of care. So so there is that like slippery slope that we're on. We, we feel how crazy it feels right now to have internalized this dynamic of of both being the person who is who is failing and being judged and also judging other people. And then even just more basically the sort of, you know, overused word, but trauma that everyone's experiencing where they're defining contact with with other human beings as sites of potential danger. What are the long term consequences of that? Right. So I'm teaching this first year seminar that's called Modern Plagues. I've taught it a few times before. This year, I'm teaching it a little bit differently because this time I organized it around sort of themes related to epidemic management and control. 
this week we were talking about quarantine and the logics of quarantine. And so I gave them Foucault and I gave them the first half of his chapter from Discipline and Punish on panopticism, Mm -hmm. which of course begins with the epidemic town, right? This is what an epidemic town looks like. Everybody shudders. Some people come come to your house. They make sure that you're not sick or whatever. Occasionally they, they let you out of the house. They spray so that it doesn't smell bad and they let you go back in. <laughs> you know, so he introduces panopticism, you know, this Bentham, basically the, the architecture of discipline, the architecture of disciplinary mechanisms, I guess. And one of the things that is striking is, you know, this is supposed to be sort of a utopian kind of architecture in the sense that you don't need force anymore. You don't need like the armed guards necessarily to guard people, to, you know, in these institutions. Everyone feels watched and therefore act accordingly. They don't do the bad thing because they, they know they're being watched. They don't know by whom. They don't know under what circumstances. They don't really, you know, but the threat of force is, is kind of lingering. And it, but it's, it's lingering amongst us. It's lingering within ourselves. The self-discipline becomes becomes the sort of mode of being in the world. We are all cops. We are all cops. Oh, God, I don't want to be there. But that's how I'm feeling right now. Like It's basically like we have these sort of distributed spy networks now. It's the anti-neoliberal person's nightmare, right? It's that we have privatized our policing or at least localized it. We become part of the machine of state power. Like it, it becomes distributed in us. We become, we are the state. When speaking of the relationship to the state, this ties back to our discussion about conspiracy theories and what you said about how assigning certain types of blame is also a way of not assigning other types. And Amanda Hess writes, quote, both the crowds and the shamers are reacting to the same stressor, a catastrophically incompetent government response, which boils down to warning us all to avoid human contact indefinitely. It's like kind of what our power is reduced to is just this judgment. Yeah, I mean, that's ultimately it. Because we would not be bearing this responsibility or shouldering it if they had done their job right. Like we're basically doing what we do in the absence of a kind of legitimate high-scale authority. Even the most expert people can be caught in these same sorts of really distorted frameworks for interpreting the world. Your book, HIV Exceptionalism, Development Through Disease in Sierra Leone, is is all about how Sierra Leone, like the rest of West Africa, has actually really low prevalence of HIV, yet receives just a hugely disproportionate share of international healthcare funding targeting HIV and AIDS. And you write, quote, this foreign aid comes in large part because international donors believe HIV is an exceptional condition requiring a focused, intensive response that is unlike any directed to other diseases. We've been talking about sort of the the conspiracy theories high and low. What accounts for international public health funding basically treating Sierra Leone as though it has much higher HIV prevalence levels than it actually does? You know, this was a time, at the time that I was working on this book, this was a time where, you know, Sierra Leone had come out of this decade-long war, and there was at least a framing that war kind of changes everything. And because it's Africa, and because, you know, people are doing all kinds of things, there's widespread sort of sexual violence associated with war. There is a lot of sort of sex work and unprotected sex and not really great kind of health facilities. So there's still like the likelihood of blood transfusions and and that are infected, things like that. And so the idea was that despite whatever the data showed, so data were not good anyway, but we should expect some kind of explosion of HIV and AIDS. Even if it's not happening now, it's going to happen. So we had better stop it. And I'd say most of the things that Sierra Leone did didn't actually prevent it as much as it helped to institute or bring in a very like marginal new testing and care regime. That said, um, I would like to suggest that 
U.S. government, also the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, were very much invested in distributing their money to places <laughs> that were strategic. And there is something strategic about Sierra Leone in the sense that it is um, a place that has significant natural resources. Um, it is a fairly small country. And so any kinds of interventions that are funded can have an impact in some way. Strategically for the U.S., however, which has only recently come in as an AIDS uh, funder for Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone was seen as a sort of good allied ground for the war on terror. Because, so I don't know how much you know about Sierra Leone, but it's one of these places that's, it's majority Muslim, but it's like 60-40 or whatever. And it's not uncommon for people to have these sort of cross-faith, interfaith marriages, or interfaith families even. And so the way that that was actually sort of articulated or thought about in sort of U.S. foreign policy was this is really an ideal space in West Africa because Christians and Muslims get along and we can sort of use this as a space to kind of think about or, or, or fight out our sort of ideological battles against terrorism. So what HIV exceptionalism really shows us is how donor agendas actively shape what is possible for African governments and certainly for health. You analyze this patchwork of Global North and government and nonprofit institutions that direct HIV AIDS funding and programming as part of a broader system of, of transnational governance. And I guess what I wondered reading your book is why does this transnational government care if people in Sierra Leone die of AIDS given that so much other African suffering death is otherwise so normalized and acceptable. So I guess that's that's why I challenge HIV exceptionalism or exceptionalism of any sort of, or maybe even just sort of this idea that you can just sort of pick a disease and like fight it and then, you know, move on to the next thing. And I also think that that's why there are us also there's always pushback in this field. So basically we can, we are constantly moving between treat one disease like it's exceptional and fight it and then then let's do health systems and primary health care and whatever. Like you know, really build the sort of basic bread and butter public health system kind of situation where everyone can see a you know, nurse or doctor when they're sick and they can get wellness visits and all that stuff, right? So we are constantly sort of moving back and forth that way. The, the caring part is a political project. So technically governments, you know, sort of national governments are tasked with this position or tasked with the, with the, given the, or given the task of caring for the population, right? And caring is usually measured, you know, it has a, it has a metric. <laughs> so, and, or, or it, it has a metric component. And so you first have to define what the population is and segment it up and, and sort of say, this is how long everyone lives, right? There's life expectancy. Here is the acceptable norm in terms of malaria cases or typhoid or, or whatever, right? But the man, the mode of caring is at the level of the population, and in the management of a particular set of metrics that are supposed to tell you about the health and the well-being of the of that population and that is supposed to in some way help that country to develop because health is seen as one of the the main drivers of economic growth and development right <laughs> and so if you don't have healthy workers you don't have you basically can't have a healthy economy. I mean, it sounds crude, but essentially that's what it boils down to at the end of all of this. So yes, health is a public good and it's something that is great and needs to be advanced, but it's actually supposed to be a function of development. And so we're kind of living, basically, and all of this is to say, we're living with the legacy of the Cold War in that respect, right? Um, because that's where these systems emerged. These systems, the, the very idea that a state can develop and that there's a, a sort of stage at which they've reached their full development is a Cold War idea. And the fact and the and that and the idea that there are states that are at that stage of development and should help those other ones move along it. That's also a Cold War idea. Well, referring back to the discussion we were having about 
Obama, this sort of brings us back to that because you write, quote, a true reckoning of the Ebola response, a different origin story, must also account for failures to implement robust public health systems in light of extensive and significant health sector expenditure by foreign donors in the aftermath of the civil conflicts in these countries. Because what this all suggests, I think, is that certain origin stories, the work they do is to obscure and mystify other origin stories, ones that we might call maybe more more factually grounded ones. The Civil War, which took off in a region that, quote, has also been the site of an ongoing century-long land grab by Firestone. And you continue, quote, Extractive industries like diamond mining and cash crop agriculture and even the transatlantic slave trade have, to varying degrees, done their share of environmental, economic, political, and psychic damage to generations of Sierra Leoneans. Fiscal policies like structural adjustment, which capped wages for healthcare workers, reduced civil service jobs in the health sector, and led to steady declines in health financing, also took their toll. How do you see the importance of, of this history, given that what acute crises seem to do is call forth these more superficial origin stories, as though almost what's happening is that with the creation of every new layer of historical violence and exploitation, those other layers are only further obscured and rendered more invisible? We, we are talking about something that has been happening for decades these moments of emergency where we are forced to reckon with those enduring mistakes or those gradual disenfranchisement. So when I left public health school in 2001, right after that, I remember how the jobs changed, right? So I I was suddenly looking for these jobs to work internationally on health issues or whatever. I was hoping that I would actually get a CDC job. And all of a sudden they, they started freezing hires. And those jobs never actually came back. The point being is we've decimated that that sector or that group of 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 government workers that sort of that would have been that is sort of responsible for the nation's public health. When they had to pull together the staff to go and help in West Africa, there were many deployments, the largest deployments in the history of, of the organization, I believe. They could only take full-time employees because of liability issues. And so that meant that they had to go really deep. They, could, they couldn't rely simply on people who were trained in infectious disease. They had to send people who were not at all qualified to do um, the jobs that they sent them to do. So if you think about what that looked like for an Ebola outbreak in a country that is not the United States, and think about what's happening now, We don't even see the CDC head giving regular press conferences. CDC doesn't even have a good case count of COVID-19 cases. They put out those botched tests, right? We're kind of like basically trying to, to MacGyver our way out of a situation of our making, but only addressing the sort of the things that are within our immediate view and the tools that appear to be the most easily deployed for us. And that is a result of one of the deeper origin stories, which is the decimation of our public health system and primary health care system, our refusal to actively reform our, our the way that we finance health care. And we should also talk about the racial disparities that exist in those cases and deaths and how those are intimately linked to systematic racist systems in terms of housing, in terms of employment, education, and so on. And yes, we could probably even go back to the slave trade. Like what would happen if you if you built an infectious disease epidemiological model that took reparations into account? Huh. Like what would yeah. that look like instead of just talking about quarantines and, and hospital capacity? What would happen if you actually actively participated in or imagined interventions that addressed some of those fundamental causes of inequality that are being brought to the fore in the crisis? Your work on HIV exceptionalism explores how systems of biopolitical governance shape shape not only political economy, but very much subjectivities too. And a big purpose and function of HIV AIDS programs in Sierra Leone, you write, is is creating HIV positive 
subjects because it's not as though people just sort of automatically think their identity should be defined by their status as as HIV positive. That's something that has to be accomplished. How did this work in, in Sierra Leone and what does that tell us about how things might play out now with COVID, with with these immunity passports under discussion in some countries and this complex surveillance systems in place in China, these emerging systems that will control movement and access to public and workspaces based on an individual's disease status? This is actually something I, I recently started thinking about, um, especially as I start to talk to, to, to you know, sociologists and historians who work on similar questions. So one of the things that is interesting about HIV is that, like, rather than being immune with an infection, you're basically living with it all your life. And you're not immune, right? But the, in, in the case of COVID-19... Um, and we still don't know this for sure, is that the expectation is that you have immunity for maybe some short amount of time. And so in addition to conferring immunity, maybe it confers other kinds of political opportunity. And one might call that biological citizenship. Hmm, who knows? Biological citizenship. What does that mean? Biological citizenship, I think, was first elaborated by Adriana Petrina, And her work was actually about the Ukraine in the aftermath of Chernobyl. Basically, what it means is making claims on the state on the basis of a biological condition. In this case, it was radiation poisoning. But in the case that I write about it in my in my first book, it's I'm talking about the social forms that build up around being HIV positive particularly the kinds of claims that Sierra Leoneans were making on the state as a result of their HIV positivity. You're talking about basically sort of separating out and potentially creating hierarchies on the basis of biological status and immunity. And that's a problem for a bunch of reasons because it maps onto or looks like other kinds of systems of marginality and discrimination and hierarchy related to presumed biological difference. So like apartheid. That said, one of the things that I, I've been thinking about with my, my Ebola research is, you know, I, I was following some survivors, talking to them. They made me question some of the things I was saying in my first book by saying, hi, we would like to use this as an opportunity to mobilize around survivorship in a particular way. And so in other words, a lot of the Ebola survivors that I met were saying, well, can we talk about healthcare for all? And can we talk about really expanding care in rural areas? Because a lot of the people who had Ebola and survived it are experiencing something like a post-Ebola syndrome and need need ongoing care, need ongoing assistance. So, you know, there were neurological problems, ophthalmological problems and and hearing problems. So people were having a a range of um, sort of post Ebola survivorship health conditions. I mean, they were also involved in a lot of experiments. And so a lot of them are really quite well-versed in ethics, you know, sort of bioethics and like, how do you negotiate with uh, companies that are trying to use your biological material um, or trying to use you as as a guinea pig or a test subject? Um, They're really concerned about the use of biological material by people who don't necessarily have the best interests of Sierra Leoneans at heart. Um, Survivors were using that status to actually mobilize around a broader health justice agenda. Well, and that's a major contrast to what you saw with, with HIV. Right, because HIV is, yeah, like people wanted to kind of hoard resources under that under those conditions. And they weren't mobilizing a bro- across broad sort of health agenda goals, right, or justice goals related to health. Um, and these sur- Ebola survivors are doing quite the opposite, um, trying to really expand the scope of health and healthcare, not only for people who survived, but for, for their families. What would it look like to politicize this moment of pandemic disease in a more progressive rather than reactionary way? Watching this, this kind of activism, this kind of response from survivors and their concern about something like reparations made me think about what this epidemic or this pandemic actually makes possible for us, 
who have a progressive agenda. So a lot of us are ta- who are very much about Medicare for all or universal health coverage or, or, or a range of, or the things that sort of lie in between have been saying is that, you know, now that we're, we're fully all ma- being made fully aware of the limits of our health system, if we have, if in fact we have one at all, um, it, you know, it's, it's forcing us to think about how that system is financed, how it's structured and organized, not only to deliver care, but also to, to, to aid in the sort of basic functions of public health. Um, how do we mobilize and think um, different geographies of scale or polit- politics of scale for thinking about health and healthcare? And then all of these other things that it, it revealed about life and livelihoods outside of these questions of health. So why was it, why is it so devastating for us to um, stay at home? Why do we need to stay at home in the first place, (laughs) right? So why weren't we able to mobilize um, these sort of basic uh, bread and butter parts of public health, which is, you know, isolation, contact tracing, testing, all these things that, that worked in other contexts. So things that worked in Taiwan or South Korea. So immune or not, I think what may happen is that because so many people are going to be infected by this thing and affected by this, is it may be the way a, a method or means by which um, people start to organize around or politically mobilize around that status because of how of the long term effects or because of the kinds of problems it revealed um, in terms of healthcare finance, how healthcare is financed and, and reimbursed and all of that stuff because of access questions in rural areas and in certain urban um, sort of quote unquote deserts. Um, and so there are a bunch of, of ways that I imagine that, you know, beyond immunity or beyond uh, survivorship, that people may see this as an opportunity to make it possible to imagine otherwise. We're imagining prison abolition, <laughs> you know, or, right. or at least releasing people from jails and prisons in, in a way that's, I think, much more robust and widespread than it was before. Um, we're thinking about policing as, is it essential work? Is it essential labor being done for us? We're asking whether essential work is is a is is a way to justify and rationalize sacrifice and expendability. Well, Adia Benton, thank you very much, especially for ending on a non dystopian note. <gasps> That's my first time. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Adia Benton is a professor of anthropology and African studies at Northwestern University. She is the author of HIV Exceptionalism, Development Through Disease in Sierra Leone, and she is currently writing a book about the West African Ebola outbreak. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said after noting that, the ruling ideas are nothing more than the ideal expressions of the dominant material relationships. The dominant material relationships grasped as ideas. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis, music by Jeffrey Brodsky, Our communications coordinators are Julia Rock and Zachary Nin. Our senior advisor is Thea Riofrancos. Check out our vast archives at thedigradio.com and do follow us on Twitter or Facebook at The Dig Radio. And please find us wherever you get podcasts. And subscribe. If it is on iTunes or wherever, please leave us a nice review. Rating and reviewing our show ostensibly helps introduce it to new listeners, but what really and truly does that is you telling friends about the show. Please make propaganda for us. And do find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to help keep this operation up and running strong. Even a few bucks is huge.